Good morning, church. Ah, I love you guys. Man, I was thinking about you guys this week, and it's just been, you guys are just amazing. Like, I'm having, I'm not kidding you. I was actually talking to my colleagues this week and just was like, man, this is like the best church experience I've ever had. Like, it's just amazing, you know? It's like, I almost feel like it's like hand in glove. And some of you are like, yeah, but a glove you throw away. But I'm, don't throw me away. But anyway, just hand in glove. And, and I've just enjoyed you guys so much. And I enjoy Petaluma. Like, it's awesome here. I know some of you think it's hot. I would just encourage you to go to Nashville. It can always get worse. Or Arizona. Or God forbid, Texas. Texas will melt you into a whole different world, you know? We have some Texans in here. Yeah, former Texans. Yes, they know what I'm talking about. So anyway, we have so much going on. And I just want to remind you of a few things that are coming up. So number one, we are talking about having uh, and creating a second service. And we've been talking about possibly doing it at nighttime. And so we're beginning to get teams together to begin talking through this and forming this. If you would like to be part of that conversation, please let us know. Also, I wanted to let you know that uh, I met this week with the Next Gen team, and we had a great conversation around youth beginning in the fall. Did you just hear that? Yeah, youth yeah. beginning in the fall, yes. And so after they heard some of my crazy ideas, I don't know if they want me to do that anymore. But I consider myself a good youth pastor, man. I, I had so many visits to the ER, it was just <laughs> insane. So anyway, so we're tracking with that. And then we have the support group for families that um, they have an LBGTQ loved one. And we're trying to figure out ways that we can better walk alongside families so they don't have to suffer in silence. And then we're also working on uh, these seminars around mental health and spirituality and how our church can journey together with people through some difficult stuff. And so we've got a lot going on. Amen? Amen. And yeah, yeah, you can clap to that. That's all good. We've, we've got a lot going on. And here's the key thing. It would go better with you involved. Yeah. All right? So I want you to be praying about your part and where God is taking us because it is a very, very bright future. All right? Yeah. Let's pray. So Father, we come before you this morning and we're so thankful that we can be here together. Father, some of our church family this past week has received some tough news medically. And some people that I've been talking with here in the last few weeks, Father, have heard horrible words like cancer and Parkinson's, ALS. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would begin to heal. To do an amazing word that can only be attributed to you. Father, I pray that as a church, we would journey together with people well. That we would love well and be present. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. So we are in a series that Pastor Ron started last week called The Divine Sandwich. And it was so awesome to watch him build the sandwich on stage, right? Even with the oregano. For those of you that weren't here, it kind of spilled out. But I like oregano. I don't know. That much might have been good. I don't know. But it, it, I'm sure it was amazing. And so anyway, so he built a sandwich last week. I'm not going to do that to you because I remember how I felt being out there wanting to eat that sandwich, okay? So anyway, it was a great start to the teaching series that we are involved in. It's really a teaching series that is kind of, if, if I can say this, it's like, you know, in, in Colossians chapter 1, we have the, the most Christology passage in all of Scripture with Paul. And it's kind of like, the, the, the top of the ladder, top tier kind of stuff. This passage in, in 2 Peter is the same thing. It's kind of like top tier. It's like um, I actually, um, my mentor actually wrote a book on this. It was called Hidden in Plain Sight. 
And it's actually a way for us to progress and to grow in all of those things. And so anyway, Pastor Ron did a great job last week. Can we give him a round of applause? Did a great job on that. And so today we're going to be continuing it. We're going to look at the word goodness. There, goodness. You know, faith in, in Hebrew says, faith is what? It's, it's the substance. It's, it's the things that we hope for, but the things not what? Seen. So faith is this thing that kind of motivates us. Remember we talked about faith kind of as an action verb, right? And it, it kind of moves us forward. It's, and all of us in here, we, we, we have faith, right? And different levels of faith. And so it's really important for us to see what Peter tells us to do with this. And the first thing he says is this. Let's look at this passage of Scripture. Through these, he, he being God, has given us very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make effort, every effort, to add to your faith, what? Goodness. goodness. And so today we want to talk about goodness and, and this incredible invitation that we have from God that we can participate in the divine nature with him. Now, that's a great mystery, Right? I mean, that, that is huge, and, and we can participate in that. And this kind of shows up a little bit in John chapter 17, where Jesus is doing, uh, praying his high priestly prayer. And interestingly enough, it, he says that, that you would be one with God, and as he is one with God, and God is one with Jesus, and we could be one with Jesus as God is one with him. You, you kind of see how that's interplaying? But the interesting thing there is the word Holy Spirit's not mentioned. Where does the Holy Spirit live? In us. In us. So we already have this capability of living in unity with the Father and the Son. Amen? That's a beautiful thing. And so what Peter's doing is he's helping us understand how to operate in the divine nature. And so he uses this first word, goodness. Now, one of the interesting things about goodness, it's kind of like the other words in the New Testament. You know, English language is, is, is you know, it's different. And, and in the Greek, they have more precise words. Does that make sense? And so sometimes there's not a direct correlation. So when Bible translators, one of my... Um, one of my mentors, Trent Butler, Dr. Trent Butler, he was actually one of the translators of the NIV Bible. And he was the executive translator of the Holman Christian Standard Bible. And so, you know, translation is a very, very complicated thing. Because not only are you looking at words, but you're looking at culture. You're looking at what, what the situation was being written to. And then sometimes you get these words like hest in the Old Testament that could have like, I don't know, 11 different words that it could mean, right? And so as we go into Scripture and as we look at our Bibles, sometimes these words, like goodness, have a deeper meaning. Or maybe it leans us a different direction than maybe what we're thinking. And, and we get to learn why the authors chose the words that they chose. Now you're saying, Shane, are you saying there's hidden stuff in the Bible that I can't get? No, you can there's this wonderful thing. I don't know if you've ever heard of it or not. It's called Google. <laughs> and there's this website that you can go to called the Bible Hub. It's free. You can go on there and you can learn all kinds of great things. It'll break the Greek down for you, the Hebrew down for you, the Aramaic, all of those things. And so there's some beautiful stuff there. And so today I want to take you on a little bit of a journey. And I'm going to show you this week some very, very powerful truths. You ready? Okay, first phrase I want you to repeat is this. Words matter. Words absolutely matter. And so we, we know that Peter is writing in a Greco-Roman context. We know that he's writing to the dysphoria, to, to, 
to Christians who have been spread across. And he's writing this, his two wonderful letters about how to be better Jesus followers. And it's packed full of so many beautiful imagery, like we're a holy people, a holy nation, we're peculiar, and, and, and there, there isn't any difference between us, and we're here to show the goodness of God. We'll look at that here in just a few minutes, but Peter's writing this, and so he's using some very, very interesting words here. So let's look at words matter. The next slide. I want to give you an example of this. You know, in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, this is the fruit of the spirits passage, right? The fruits, plural, not plural spirits, but plural fruits, fruits of the spirit. And it says here, it says, but the fruit of the spirit is love. Now, interestingly enough, I've actually preached a sermon series on this and I use the fruit of the spirit is love, colon, and here's what it looks like, the words behind it. So just a different take. But anyway, it says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and what? Goodness and faithfulness. So I want you to look at this word here. This word, we're not going to pronounce it together because none of us would say it right and I would butcher it. Um, so this word here is very interesting. It, it's translated as goodness or what? Moral excellence. moral excellence. The connotation, it implies a moral and ethical quality encompassing kindness, generosity, and good nature. It is a broader, more general term that refers to the inherent goodness of a person. In Christian context, it is often used to describe the fruits of the Spirit highlighting moral goodness in action and in character. And I think, you know, if you've been in church any length of time, you've heard all kinds of sermons on this passage of Scripture, and that is what that word goodness means. Now, interestingly enough, that's not the word goodness that Peter uses. Peter uses the word goodness that's only found four times in all of Scripture. Three times he uses it. The fourth time Paul uses it in Philippians. And I want you to see the power of this because it is amazing. Let's go to the next slide. Verse five. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith, what? Goodness. Goodness. This word... Arte is a very important word. The definition is commonly translated what? Virtue or moral excellence. Kind of sounds like the other word, right? But let's stay with it. Connotation. It refers to excellence of any kind. And then what's it say? Achieving one's highest potential. This term is more about the fulfillment of purpose and function. The act of living up to one's full potential. In classical Greek thought, aorte is closely associated with human flourishing, the pursuit of excellence in various domains, including moral, intellectual, and physical aspects. Now, I want you to see this context. In ancient Greek philosophy, particularly the words, works of Plato and Aristotle, arte is a central concept. It is tied to the idea of living a life of reason and virtue, cre- uh, contributing to the well-being of who? The individual. And who else? Society. Society. This kind of changes goodness a little bit, doesn't it? Do you see where Peter's taking this? Peter is saying that we have to add to our faith goodness. And I I don't think it takes long for us to look around and see that the world is lacking some goodness. Are you with me? Lacking some goodness. In some places and spaces, it's a profound lack of goodness. 
And oftentimes I know for myself when I think about, oh Lord, like, can you do something about this? Can you, can you bring your goodness and your peace? Oftentimes I think about the God out there coming in and bringing peace and bringing goodness. Are you with me? But this passage of scripture is a little different. It's a little different. We are called to participate in the divine nature of God. And part of that journey is us being the very best people we can be. Striving to reach our full potential. Not just for ourselves, but for the community around us. Now, this isn't self-help. This is Bible. We are to pursue the very best. Do you know what the enemy of best is? It's good. It's good. It's good enough. How many times have we used those words? It's good enough. Unless you're OCD and then it's never good enough. (laughs) Right? But I think, unfortunately, not only do we as people kind of settle in this place of I'm doing good enough or it's good enough, but I also think our institutions are kind of the same way. What we're doing is good enough, right? And I, I don't know. I, I don't, I want to I wanna be around somebody who pursues excellence, Are you with me? That is going to help me pursue excellence. And we're going to look at a few verses here in a few minutes that are are very profound. But God has called us to participate in his divine nature. And with our faith, he wants us to add this portion of goodness, this virtue, this excellence to reach our full potential. Why? So that our society, our culture our plot and square in the world, we are infecting it with goodness. So see, while we may say, God, bring goodness to us, he's like, okay, go do it. Are you with me? That's why in the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus says, blessed are the peace, what? Makers. Makers. So when we say, God, we want peace in our world, he's what? Go make it. Empowered by the Holy Spirit, right? Because see, once you enter enter into relationship with Jesus, his spirit comes to live within you. Actually, in in Corinthians, that word that we are the temple of God, that word temple means holy of holies. We are the holy of holies of God. Isn't that crazy? Like, you know me, thinking Shane's holy of holies. Isn't that awesome? Awesome. But honestly, like, and so we're in this participatory thing and God has planted within us his spirit and his spirit bears out these fruits and helps us become better versions of ourselves. He's helping us reach our full potential. Let's look at these three verses that I talked about earlier where Peter is using this word. 1 Peter 2, 9. But you are not like that, for you are a chosen people. You are a royal priest, a holy nation, God's very own possession. That could preach for weeks. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. But that word there, show the goodness of God, that word is the same that we just discovered. It's showing the fullness of God. It's showing the fullness of God the best way we can and showing everyone the potential in God. Are are you with me? Have you ever met someone sometime, maybe it was uh, somebody more seasoned in their faith? and you begin to rub shoulders with them and they just ooze something different. You just wanna be around them. They're kind, they're gracious, but there's this 
depth of faith and goodness about them. How, how many of you know what I'm talking about? Oh, uh, there was this lady on Vancouver Island where Lori and I served for, I can't remember, like seven and a half years. And her name was Miss Joy. And Miss Joy, like, wow. Like, I can't even, I wouldn't even be here today without Miss Joy. She's just a wonderful, wonderful lady. She had been counseling longer than I had been alive. But when you bump shoulders with her, you just end up walking away feeling better about yourself and you feel better about God. Are you with me? There's something, there's something tangible there. She was able to display for me God in a way that I really hadn't seen before. That's what this means. You're showing the goodness of God. Let's move on. 2 Peter 1.3, same passage we're looking at. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who has called us by his glory and what? Goodness. Now we think of goodness again as, oh, God's just being good. He's letting me in. No, the goodness is his excellence. His full potential. Everything about God, he's calling us to him. Amen? Amen. And this is a beautiful picture. It's, it's attractive. The New Testament says that we enter into relationship with God because of his goodness that draws us to him. It's not his anger that draws us to him. Amen? I mean, how many of you as kids were like, yeah, I want to go hang out when my dad is angry because of what I did? <laughs> Nobody does that, right? We all go to our room, shut the door, you know, get on a bike and ride somewhere. Nowadays, it's a scooter, whatever. And we, but no, we were like, we don't want to go be around dad if he's angry or mom if she's upset. Same thing with God. He's not calling us out of that. He's calling us out of his excellence, his full potential, his goodness is drawing us to himself. Isn't that beautiful? And then again, this passage for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness. So when we think about goodness from here on out, part of it is we've got to think about reaching our full potential. Becoming that what God envisioned. See, we, we in our culture, we kind of have it backwards. Our culture values youth right? We even hear the stories about people who've been at companies 25, 30 years, and they're suddenly let go. Why? Because they want to bring in somebody, what? Younger. But the Bible doesn't operate that way. The Bible values age and faithfulness. How old was Moses? He was 80, at least, right? Are you following me here? Like, and so sometimes, you know, when we're in this passage of scripture, it, we have to understand that he's wanting us to be more of who we are at 90 than we were at 19. He wants us to be more of who he envisioned us to be at 90 versus 29. Do, do you see that? Yeah. We're not to stop growing in our pursuit of being the best that we can be. And that means we're going to have to change our mindset. So I want you to look here. How do we do this? So the very first thing is changing our mindset. We have to think differently about ourselves and about the society in which we live in. We have to think differently about it. How many of you have ever played sports? Doesn't matter what sport, okay? So play sports. I, I would love to say music, but as you know, I'm profoundly lacking. <laughs> I have none, zero. Spike took it from me. So <laughs> anyway, this, this idea of sports, you know, and I, I used to play on some teams. I used to play basketball. I played for like, I don't know, five years, six years, and I played soccer. Boy, that was funny. <laughs> but anyway, we weren't that good. 
Were you ever on a team that wasn't that good? Oh, yeah. Right? And you just kind of knew. You know, you want, you're, you're dressing up, you're getting your uniform on, and you just know you're about to be spanked. <laughs> you just know it's not about to be good, right? Because of the overwhelming odds, right? Remember that, um, that football movie with Denzel Washington and his football team when he played the, culture, uh, the coach? What was it? Um, Titans or something like that, right? And here's this team that nobody thought would be anything. And yet they believed in something. So it's interesting. We're, we're going to do something a little different here. There was a song that I heard, and it was probably about four years ago. And I remember I was praying through like some stuff because man, there was things happening in Canada. It was just a dark time dealing with COVID and other issues. And I'm just trying to figure out my way through it. And to be honest with you, I was becoming intimidated. I know that's maybe hard for some of you to believe, but I was becoming intimidated by the forces that are out there. The darkness that is out there. And then I heard this song, which the Holy Spirit ministered to me through this song. It's about changing your perspective. It's a song by a band called Rival Sons. They're actually from Long Beach. Yeah, and they're recorded in Nashville, so I kind of feel a kinship to them, you know? But this song really is that kind of moment where the coach is talking to that team that doesn't think it can win, doesn't think it can make a difference enough to beat this team, this colossal giant in front of them. And so this is kind of like the coach giving a pep talk. All right? You ready to hear it? Okay, these guys are going to kill it. Awesome. No pressure. When Shane first played me the song, I said, well, that sounds like a playground taunt. You're going to see what I mean in a minute. You know, on the playground, there's the bullies, right? And then there's the good kids. Sometimes we think of the good kids as the weak ones. This is a song about the good kids being the strong ones. And if you think this sounds like a taunt, I want you to think about it being fierce about your goodness. We are called to shine a light into the world. And we are called to be good. And if the words that start out bother you, try to imagine Jesus saying them.
the sky Splitting through the darkness Putting a light into their eyes Oh, we move through the world Like shooting stars across the sky Splitting through the darkness Putting a light into their eyes Oh that awesome yeah. yeah that's a cool song eh and that my friends uh and, and i'll say it this way that that's my mindset that's how i live i want my love to be stronger than hate amen and i want my faith to be greater than people's doubts and man sometimes that laughter needs to be present more than the screaming amen and like this last week, especially in our world politically, we've witnessed a lot of screaming. Amen? And I love that part about just being stars. Like, we're here for a moment and then we're gone. Isn't that what Scripture says? We're here for a moment and we're gone. What is our purpose? To shine light. And so that's my thought. Like, there's nothing out there that can topple us. Amen? There's nothing out there that can topple us. Our love is stronger than hate. So when we bump into it in the world, approach it with confidence. Be your best. Live into your potential and love like crazy love. And you watch hate just dissipate. Have you ever noticed that maybe somebody gets angry with you and they're so disrespectful? They're ready for you to come back and start just like, right? right? And when you say, I'm sorry and I love you, and I hate that my actions unintendedly cause these things in your life, wow, goodness wins the day, doesn't it? Yeah. Amen? Amen? Like these are very, very powerful concepts. So let's keep going here. So you need to change your mindset. The second thing, know yourself. Now that, again, it's, that's not some new agey concept. That's what Jesus came and talked to us about, who we are and what we could be. So know yourself. Know the areas that you need improvement in. Amen? I mean, not all of us are like Miss Monica, who has no areas of improvement to have to happen. Most of us have areas of improvement, right? We, we have these areas where we need to grow a bit. You, you remember last week when Ron wrote all that out and said, pick one that you want to work on? Remember that? Why? Because we can't do them all at the same time. Because then we're just going to go, ah! <laughs> That's me putting on the brakes. <laughs> but anyway, it really, it really is. It's, it's, it's about us taking this idea and this concept of goodness and saying, okay, I need to know myself. I need to be kind to myself, but I also need to look at what are the areas I need to fortify and make stronger, and what are my strengths that I should be building upon. So knowing yourself and your propensities are really, really important. The next one is huge. Commit to continue learning. My brothers and my sisters, we will die in comfort zones. Are you with me? We will die in comfort zones. My job as your pastor is to follow Jesus, right? And help us follow Jesus. Did Jesus leave into comfort zones? No. He stretches us. We have to continue to learn. And you know what the beautiful thing is? Is I didn't even know what goodness meant until this week when I started preparing for it. 
I learned something brand new that I'm sharing with you. And it's been revolutionary for me and my thinking, right? It's about me being the best I can be. Why? Not only for myself, but for you and for this community that we sit in. So continue to learn, continue to stretch yourself because my brothers and my sisters, we are always discovering new things. Amen? Amen. Develop resilience. Now, this is interesting. Um, there's, let's pretend there's a, a wall in front of you, right? And, and, and you're often slamming your head into the wall. How many of you feel like that sometimes, right? And then sometimes, sometimes our head is harder than the brick wall and the brick wall comes down, amen? All right, now this is a funny story. It's a true story, it's a funny story. I used to be on a martial art team and um, we would travel around the Southeast doing demonstrations. And the thing that I was known for was breaking concrete <laughs> with my head. And the most I ever broke was 10 inches, 10 inches of concrete. We would buy our blocks from Lowe's, right? And I remember one time when we got the reinforced blocks and didn't know it. Woo! Shane's head dribbled like a basketball. But anyway, I'm okay. It's all good, you know? <laughs> anyway. And, you know, and sometimes when we slam our head against the wall, the wall comes down. And what we want to do in American culture is we want to go, okay, at what speed did you hit the wall? What angle, precise angle did you use? We want to synthesize it, right? So that we can come up with an equation and hand it out to people so that they automatically have the head harder than a brick wall concept, right? That's what we do in American culture, right? You know what it's like in biblical culture? Just keep hitting it till it comes down. Did you see the difference? You keep coming against it until it comes down. That is resilience. It's when I face the opposition that I don't grow weaker and shy away. I turn green and rip my shirt and get bigger. Amen? That's the Hulk, by the way, for those of you that aren't into comics. But that's kind of the biblical picture of resilience. It's the continual, constant, consistent, every single day, bringing your fullest potential everywhere you go. And guess what? Those things will come down eventually. They will come down eventually. And so this is what God is calling us to, to reach our full potential. Next one, join a small group. You say, Shane, come on, man. Like you're really stretching it here. No, you need people to call out the best in you. You ever grew up in a home I have, where, yeah, I wasn't outside and feral, <laughs> but grew up in a home where you never heard the words, I'm proud of you. You can be so much more. Hearing the words, there's so much untapped potential in you. And when you don't hear those things and somebody finally says that to you, it's like a fountain of living water on the inside, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's like, wow, somebody believes in me. Somebody sees me. Because listen, there's so many of us that walk around and we don't feel seen. Yep. And what small groups do is it allows me to be with people who are like-minded, who are trying to reach their fullest potential. And they get to speak into my life and encourage the best in me. And guess what? I get to do the same for them. Like it's important to have a small group, my brothers and my sisters, because sometimes it can get pretty lonely, can it not? Yeah. And sometimes we feel like we're the only ones going through it. We're the only ones 
that are suffering because we're trying to re be our full potential and all those things. And then all of a sudden we're in a room with like-minded people. We're speaking life into each other. And then maybe you can begin praying that God gives you a mentor. Somebody who can keep guiding you and shaping you and pouring thoughts into you that maybe you haven't considered before. I am so thankful. I've had many mentors, not many, but I've had a few in my life that have meant the world to me. Pastor Ron's a mentor to me. He means the world to me. He's helped me see things, right? Are, are you with me? So it's important that we have these connections. Why? Because God wants us to reach our fullest potential. Did you notice that Jesus didn't even journey alone? He journeyed with 13 people. The dudes and Mary Magdalene who kept them all straight and going the right direction. <laughs> right? Amazing stuff here. And this last one. Oh, if this last one. If we could just... If we could just breathe and pause our knee-jerk reactions... And just take a deep breath and invoke that spirit of curiosity. Staying adaptable and open to change. See, when we sit down in our world, unfortunately right now we can't even get people to sit down together. Right? And when we do, it's mostly yelling and screaming sessions. You know what's missing there? Profound curiosity. As a church, we should be curious about what God is doing in our city and in our county. Amen? Amen. Yes. Because he is doing stuff. You, you know that, right? God, God's not sitting at Dillon Beach in a chair reading a book. He's active. And he's calling us to partner with him. First Corinthians, I mean, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. He's calling us to partner with him. He's calling us, he's given us this invitation to walk in and participate in his divine nature. And one of the steps that you can do is be curious. Be curious about people. Show an interest. Don't just go, oh, they're wrong. Are you sure? Are you sure you're not wrong? Are you with me? Showing curiosity. Have you ever sat down with somebody of a different ethnicity and talked about spiritual things together? If you haven't done that, you're missing a beautiful chance to grow and a beautiful chance to gain deeper insight. You guys actually pastored a church where you guys were like kind of the only white people there, right? Wasn't that experience profound when you start hearing from a minority race? Like, it, it's unbelievable. Listen, I experienced this firsthand with my work with First Nations people, working with Aboriginal people in Canada. Like, they would speak to me about God. And if I wasn't curious, I wouldn't have grown. I wouldn't have seen how they have such a high value for the creator who created a world full of goodness. Isn't that amazing? There's things that you can do. Put yourself in uncomfortable situations. Listen to podcasts. Watch videos. Sit with people that you may not even like. But be curious. And in that, I believe that we become a little more knowledgeable, but I also believe we become a little more empathetic. We become a little more understanding. And all of that is helping us reach our potential, right? Because one thing we know, Jesus encountered all kinds of people, right? And the only people he had a tough time with were the ones who thought they were right all the time about everything. Are you with me? So my brothers and my sisters, this command that Peter is giving us about being good, it's not just about going around and being good. It's about reaching my full potential. Because my full potential, driven by the Holy Spirit of God, 
is a catalyst for change. My brothers and my sisters, there is so much potential sitting right here in this room. I wish you could see it the way I see it. I wish you could see the possibilities the way I see the possibilities. People need what we have here. Amen? Amen. Everybody's loved. Amen? Amen. Everybody's loved. Nobody's what? Perfect. Perfect. Besides, (laughs) nobody's perfect. And this is the beautiful part. Anything, anything is possible. Can you imagine living your life believing that anything is possible? That's goodness. So let's strive to be gooder people. (laughs) That's some Southern there for you, all right? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. So Father, I come before you now and I'm so thankful for your word. Father, I'm so thankful for Peter who wrote these things down so that people like me can understand. Father, I'm so thankful for what I learned this week. Father, I'm so thankful that you have not just called us and set us aside, but you've called us, invited us to partner and participate with you in your nature. Father, I pray this week as we go that we would look at some of these steps and maybe pick one or two that we can improve on. Father, I'm so thankful for what my brothers and sisters are going to accomplish this week in their various places and spaces they go. In your name I pray, amen.